Hey everyone, uh, it's Dr. Rick, and I am here at Bright Light Imaging in Elk Grove Village. I'm having an echocardiogram done, so the reason I wanted to do this video was to uh, inform my patients and anybody that's a subscriber that there are options that are honestly cheaper than going through your insurance to have imaging studies done. Now this is called an echocardiogram or 2D Doppler and it's for getting a image of the structure of the heart and the function of the valves of the heart. And in my case, I just took a group of hikers to Colorado, 14,000 feet, and it was tough. So at 59, I think I'm entitled to shortness of breath, but for those of you who follow me on my YouTube channel, uh, when we got to the second summit, my oxygen saturation dropped to 60 and that was lower than anybody else in the party and I was short of breath but that's somewhat expected as a perceived exertion issue. Hey everybody it's Dr. Rick and we're at Mount Evans summit 14,264 feet 14,264 feet and here's how one side Mount Evans Oaks. That's where we came from. I'm sure you could see that. I don't have to turn the camera around, but that's the parking lot for Summit Lake. Summit, Summit Lake. And then this is the surrounding structure. Of Since then, going back down to Chicago altitude, I've continued with my exercises as usual, but I found a little bit of more exertional dyspnea or uh, shortness of breath with exertion than usual. So I decided to pull the trigger and make sure I didn't have any issues with cardiomyopathy or failure. Hopefully I'll have a good result from the cardiologist or at least the interpretation here at Bright Light Imaging. If you have an MRI in a hospital, it'll cost upwards of $3,000. I just had a patient get an MRI of the brain with and without contrast for $400 and I think 25 cents. That is fantastic compared to $3,000 and the quality with regards to the Tesla or the power of the magnet was just as good as any other hospital based MRI. So for those of you with a very high deductible per year, if you have to pay the entire 4,000 bucks if you have a $4,000 deductible, you're better off getting your order from your doctor and bringing it to bright light imaging. There's a few centers throughout the Chicagoland area, and they can save you a lot of money. Or you can just go the usual way, go to them, and then they'll bill fully, but anything that's not paid for, you pay for full amount. Or if you want to get into your imaging study quickly, consider calling Bright Light Imaging, scheduling, and or I'll put the link on the comment section down below. Don't, don't worry, please, any of my subscribers, I'm doing okay. Hopefully the results come back normal. I'll, uh, in fact, I'll switch over to the imaging study so you can see what uh, my heart looks like right now. Okay, so thank God my heart was normal. My ejection fraction was 60 to 69, which is really good for my age, for any age, actually. You want to have a really strong ejection fraction. That means your heart can pump out to the whole body within one pump and get it out efficiently. I have a little bit of regurgitation, which is normal, and there's no thickening. So thank God. This is not a test to look for how the coronary arteries are. 
and I will be doing that soon. I just have to think about the price. That's There's something that they also do at Bright Light Imaging called a cardiac angiogram or a CT angiogram. That's essentially a reconstruction, 3D, of the blood vessels of the heart. A cheaper way to do it is something called a CAC or coronary artery calcium score. Now, a calcium score is much cheaper, it's much faster. A lot of places do it like Advocate for $50 but it gives you the amount of calcium. And then by extrapolation using, I think it was the MESA trial or some other study, they can figure out if you have this much calcium, the likelihood of you having a plaque with soft or hard nodules of cholesterol is this, but it's not exact. The CT angiogram is exact. The problem is it costs a lot more, 50 bucks versus bright light imaging price is 500. The hospital, Number one, you can't get it unless you talk to a cardiologist. Number two, I'm sure it's about 2,000 bucks or more if the cardiologist will approve it. So I'm getting one from my patient. I don't need a cardiologist. Again, the question is, what are you gonna do with that information? And what we're doing is we're getting enough information to have direction. Because in some cases, it's not just, can you continue bad eating? Or can you continue sitting on the couch? It's do I have to get more aggressive with fine-tuning my nutrition, my exercise, my relaxation practice, my sleep? My patients like to do aggressive things to beat the diseases and hopefully avoid the procedures and the medicines. That's my select few. And I have a skewed population. So I also have some patients who are in the midst of a lot of disease. They have to take medicines and that's fine. But they're also getting ready to get off their medicines. I think that when you maximize on what the body can do naturally, it can actually reverse disease. By reversing disease, you actually entertain returning back to youth. That's how I look at it. When you return back to youth, you don't suffer as much. You can actually enjoy life again, and you won't have the diseases until later on. Now, eventually, we're all gonna get disease in one way or another, but if we can postpone that crap, that'd be nice. And I think we can, but Taking a medicine or taking 20 medicines technically is not the way to get back to youth. It's the way to take care and quiet down disease. My thinking is that you can take the medicines, you can have a procedure, but try to manipulate lifestyle. It's always been lifestyle first. Conservative treatments and lifestyle adjustment first, and then medicines and procedures. Now, some of my patients have cancer, some of my patients have impending heart attack and stroke, and they have no choice. They, we have to do that. Again, I still say once you take care of the disease process and stabilize it, then you work as best as possible to reverse and hopefully bring back youth. Now, I have some patients who are get, going through uh, mast cell activation syndrome or post-COVID syndrome and or POTS, uh, fibromyalgia, and, and a lot of these diseases, if I have a patient try to exercise, they go downhill really fast and they stay terrible suffering for weeks. It has to be honored that you can't just go join a gym and you can't just stop eating and lose weight. You have to do it mindfully. Uh, and a lot of my patients that are anxious, they can't just stop thinking about anxious triggers. You know, or if I say, I want you to do some mindful practice. Okay, doc, see you in six months. That's not the way it works. Don't just bank on one thing. Maybe use it first, but have another set of strategies, tactics to daisy chain out of the disease process. I wouldn't go back to old crap or old things that failed you before. I think Weight Watchers is great, but if Weight Watchers didn't sustain you before, then why go back to the same thing? As far as exercise though, and my whole thing was, I took people up to high altitude. I suffered more than I usually have, and I think it was because I took a younger group, and when I came back down from altitude, my usual exercises were more difficult than I perceived from before. Now, I also made another change. I also dropped my caloric intake and maintained a very tight uh, intermittent fasting. So my caloric intake is really low, and to maintain my exercise, especially with the body fat that I'm now carrying, which is really low, check out my DEXA scan talk, I cannot and I uh, probably should not push too hard, which is my limiting factor. That's why I cannot, because my heart has been cleared, that's why I can't push too hard and I hit the wall quickly, but I know my limitations. 
So that's why we have to talk about perceived exertion, because if you're not sure what that means, it's the amount of activity you can tolerate uh, in one given setting. This is just a scale for interpreting perceived exertion. Rate of perceived exertion can be uh, measured by a standard 1 to 10 scale or something called the Borg scale. Now, it, it goes from 10 being the highest if you're using the 1 to 10 scale and 1 being the easiest. Uh, a lot of runners use this. Uh, Borg is a little different. That's what uh, the PMR guys got do. That's physical medicine and rehabilitation doctors or physical therapists. And the Borg scale goes from 20 down to 6. So that's way down here. Sorry. You can break it down from aggressive exercise down to essentially minimal exercise. So that's essentially what perceived exertion breaks down into. So there's actually scales. And it's nice because if you're if you don't have your own coach, which I really suggest you get your own coach because it's hard to inflict self-damage. The default mode when you inflict damage and you start to suffer the day after or two days after, it's like, I'm not going to do that anymore. So next time I'm going to the gym, I'm taking it easy. It's a protective mechanism and it's okay if that's you. But sometimes when you have to be accountable to somebody else, like a coach, Coach Rick, or a trainer or somebody you've invested with, a nutritionist, a psychologist, when you invest in coaches like the guys over at the Endorphin Effect Training Center in Bartlett, it makes you accountable. It makes you, sometimes it makes people want to please the coach, just like some people want to please the doctor. I have many times had patients that they, they anticipate the visit, so they start to become, they start to exercise, they start to diet a month before their, vis their annual visit, which is why I don't maintain annual visits. I'll tell some of my guys especially, don't forget to come in on your birthday. But if I find that they only wait for the birthday meeting to start getting healthy, I'll make them come in three times, four times a year, which is the basis of my warrior package. In many cases, I have a membership where people uh, become my patients and it's a, a quarterly uh, payment. I found that if you have a yearly encounter with me. It's too easy to forget who Sagil is and what my homework was to you. Now, if you have a quarterly meeting with me, it's not easy to forget that. And I might prod you a little bit every three to four months, but that's for your intention. Because eventually, if I can get you youthful and get you balanced and get you on a streamlined, reproducible activity that's healthy, you won't need me anymore. And number one, you don't have to see me as an annual member, a warrior. You actually become a warrior and you don't need to see anybody. It's a bad business model for me, but I enjoy that. And I'll have my other jobs that I'll but keep. I've resigned myself to say that what I'm doing will not pay the bills like before. And that's okay because I have uh, satisfaction. I, I, I think the pearly gates are, there's a space for me somewhere. If it means I have to go work in a COVID clinic or work uh, for other people, that's fine. But the anyway. bottom line is that for at this point in time with the patients that I see, I think it's best to daisy chain your visits and daisy chain the changes to lifestyle every couple months. And perceived exertion is something that you should be doing or anticipating. Now, winter time is coming, so We'll have to kind of contract our activities. As you know, uh, not everybody's going to be able to go outside and run anymore or ride their bikes. So everybody's going to go indoors. And some people who don't have the option will not even go indoors. They'll just get on the couch. And if you don't have any equipment or if the indoor clutter is too tight, the only thing to do is to watch TV or read. And it's just so easy to watch TV. Turn on Netflix versus opening a book and reading. So by default, most people will decrease their activity. So my contention is that just contract your activities to something very basic. Maintain yourself through the winter. Come out or pop out in, in March, St. Patty's Day, and then kick some ass again. Just don't get too heavy or slothy. Sloth is sedentary. Just don't do that too much. If you can maintain three times a week of something, even 15 minutes, and that's all I do because of my caloric intake, my fuel is so low per day. I'm probably 1,200 calories a day, which is nothing. But if I was to try to do my usual one-hour workouts in the gym with 1,200 calories a day, I would crash. Either I'd get an injury, 
I'd be sloppy, or I'd have some other medical problem, like my fibromyalgia flare up again. So I don't want that. I've just been able to do high intensity interval training. Probably, I'm sure that I hit about a level eight. So uh, if I can maintain level eight for 15 minutes, five days a week, that's fine at 1200 calories a day. That's my formula for now. I'm sure when I turn 60 next year, that'll probably change. Knock on wood, I don't develop any diseases, but for now it works for me. And for you, it might be different, but that's why we have to come up with a formula that's personalized. There is no cookie cutter. So diabetics aren't diabetics all around. Different diabetics need different medicines or different plans to get them healthy. If you have a diabetic that also has cholesterol, that also has depression, that also has POTS syndrome, you have to be careful. So let's just talk about that. Not everybody can exercise and just get down and do push-ups. Uh, as I was mentioning earlier, COVID, fibromyalgia, POTS, uh, chronic pain syndrome, uh, disability, you have to be careful. And there are protocols that will help you. If you don't have a doctor that can help you, if you can't afford a physical therapist, if you can't afford a trainer or you're non-vaccinated and you're staying indoors, there are protocols like the Levine protocol and or uh, there's others that put out by CHOP or Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, there's protocols put out for people that crash fast. I do have a video on, I think it's uh, the late onset muscle soreness. Uh, for most of us, if you exercise, you can expect about 48 hours of pain. And most of us can muscle through that, recover, take our turmeric. Uh, so, uh, hey, by the way, uh, this coming Wednesday on Facebook, if you're a Facebook person, uh, uh, open um, invite to anybody for uh, mature athletes, getting exactly what we talked about, exercise through the winter. So it'll be with the Fruitful Yield this coming Wednesday. So the idea is to come up with a plan that won't hurt so much. If you get hurt with your first endeavors because you push too hard, you're going to remember that and you're not going to want to do it anymore. Just like my analogy to with Weight Watchers. If you did Weight Watchers for a month, you lost 30 pounds and then you gained it all back within two weeks because you binged and you celebrated too much. I wouldn't do that again because it didn't serve you the first time and it's not going to serve you now. If you trained for the marathon before, you dropped 50 pounds and then right afterward you gained it all back. Congratulations on the marathon, but don't do that again unless you do it and then immediately after that you have a daisy chain activity that will take over. Sometimes if you have that daisy chain where you chunk it down and you just have one goal after the next, that's fair. It might work in that circumstance, but if you just deploy the same thing and you have no other plan afterward, it'll put you probably into the same results. So be careful. I don't want my patients to waste their money or their time and effort, and time is important. So. The objective with trying to figure out your tolerated or perceived exertion, your level, and build up. I mean, it would be nice if we can all get to a perceived exertion of 10. If we can, that'd be great. But not, not all of us have to. If uh, those guys who walk, my patients who walk, I think that's fair. But if you can walk and you're walking with somebody and talking and giving out sentences back and forth, I would challenge you and say, you shouldn't be talking that much. You can talk and you're walking very, very quickly and you can get full sentences out and have conversation. That means you're not exerting enough. So walk faster. When you can get out one sentence every breath and then you have to take another deep breath and take a break, that is a decent pace. But even if you're walking or jogging light and you're getting out a whole sentence, like I have done in some of my videos, that's not enough exertion. My objective is to push you as best as you can and maximize on the time. If you're running, jogging, and you're with somebody just to enjoy it, then enjoy it. But if you're trying to push muscle so that it's youthful, push it. Don't lollygag around. Well, number one, disease. And I put uh, blue X's of what things I think people can change. And yes, even if you have disease, I believe that you can change it. I think that the body is miraculous. I think that you can always modify disease. And if you can't do it because the big specialists say that's nothing more we can do, you come into my world and we'll send you to my specialists. Now I deal with a lot of medical specialists, but I also deal with alternative medicine specialists. And I have different things that we can deploy, different specialties that we can deploy, whether it's Western medicine or alternative. But I do think that disease can be modified. It's tough to manipulate oxygen, but I did do a video when I'll put it uh, here right now. Uh, a friend of mine was here last week. Ox oxygen boost. 
I saw this uh, last time I was here, but I didn't give it a try. There's about 40 squirts in this. So a high altitude sickness is an uh, issue where your muscles and your brain and they don't, you don't get enough oxygen. In fact, in fact, when we uh, came up here at, what's the level of uh, the, the condo? 11? No, 10? Yeah. Well, like 10,000 where the condo is, uh, you're supposed to acclimatize, but you know, one day is not enough. So I had a little bit of a headache, and um, I'm gonna give this a try. So, I guess you just put your foot on the end and shoot it. One second. I taste the peppermint. I didn't know if I was supposed to let go of it, but I kept on going. It doesn't stop the boost. Oh yeah! <laughs> well, I was able to talk. I was slurring, if you noticed my speech, and uh, I was really crampy. And about for the next hour after coming down from Mount Evans, I was I was feeling terrible, and I had to, I didn't want to talk to anybody. I think I even started crying in the car. That was some emotional letdown because of the stress I was in, fight or flight. A lack of oxygen causes problems. Luckily, I didn't suffer anything from my heart. I'm not sure about my brain. I probably should get an MRI of my brain, but I was worried. This whole thing started because I was worried that I suffered a little bit of cardiomyopathy on the mountain from being in a hypoxic state so long. Uh, luckily, this echo is okay. I'm thinking it's just fuel uh, that I'm lacking. You can always improve oxygen by taking it in. If you are uh, at high altitude, bringing it with you. Uh, like the gas tolerance, you can develop that and improve it just with training. And there's ways to train at high altitude. We don't have that here, but there are also ways to pulse, hypoxic pulsing. It theory is there and it should be okay. Or you can get a tent that pushes hypoxia here uh, high, uh, with uh, uh, lower pressure here in at sea level or at Chicago level to get you accommodated for up there. Uh, the data is kind of okay. It doesn't sound safe to sleep in a plastic tent, especially I imagine if the oxygen flow turns off and you're stuck in a plastic tent, there's no oxygen. But either way, I think training will help and you can modify that. Fuel, you can modify. Endurance and strength, you can definitely modify. So the only thing you can't, I think it would be the oxygen, theoretically. If you are at high altitude where there's less pressure, oxygen is lower, you will have to gasp. You'll have to gasp and you'll have fast heart rate, and it's very distracting to be short of breath and have a fast heart rate, even with just taking a couple steps at 14,000 feet. Okay, Hi. so let's, come on team. Thank you. Yes, sir. We're gonna hit the summit of Mount Evans. Four team, 265. Are we here? Yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah, dude. Oh yeah. That's that's the medallion. Once I get to Everest Space Camp, which I'm planning to do uh, when I turn 60 next year, 19,000 feet. That's what Everest Space Camp is. I'm I'm not sure what I'm going to be experiencing, but. I have to, I just have to do it uh, at 60. And um, hopefully I'll make it down from the mountain, but I'm gonna start kicking some ass now and train. So this winter, those of you who wanna come with me, please check out my Facebook page, Dr. Rick Hiking Excursions, because we'll be doing, I will be doing a lot of training locally. And if you wanna come, come. Even if you don't wanna to go to Everest or Colorado or wherever, I, I am gonna be probably going to Bryce Canyon with some people. Uh, family members too, come along. Um, we'll all have fun this time. Um, not just the hikers, but the family members too. So open invite. Uh, uh, everybody come. But uh, start training. Don't let Chicago's winter button you up and get you fat. And then don't let the holidays of this winter get you guilty the day after. And don't let January 1st come along where you have to suddenly lose 10 to 20 pounds. You know it's not gonna happen. You might be lucky. 19 pounds, keep the extra one or two. And then that's usually what I see. Even if you're good at scrambling to lose all the weight, if you keep two or three pounds every year after New Year's is over, that's still a 10 to 20 pound weight gain eventually. So 
don't do that. Stop doing that now. Uh, pay it forward. Kick some ass before the holiday, then you can feast without guilt. That's what my suggestion is. So subscribe to me on my YouTube channel. I'll be putting out videos on how to compress the time frame of winter and come out the other end, hopefully by March of 2022. I'll be hosting, if I can get the right organizations to sponsor, I'll be hosting a St. Paddy's Day walk run so that we can all have a targeted date to train for. Instead of just thinking, okay, we're just cold and dreary and depressed. So thanks for watching up to this point. If you have any questions on how to maximize with uh, your medical disease or how to improve your state of health or your perceived exertion or your wall, if you hit the wall, put them in the comments section down below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you at the next video.